Welcome to the Criterion Chat, a podcast on the Criterion Collection and cinema. I'm Nate Myers, joined by Matt Peterson, as we at long last complete our discussion on Ingmar Bergman's film trilogy with The Silence. Among his most controversial and commercially successful works, The Silence marks a major pivot in the career of Swedish filmmaker Ingmar Bergman, as his focus begins to shift more towards psychological and less towards the theological. Detailing the journey of two women to an unknown land with a language neither of them understands, the film begins with the ominous sound of a stopwatch over its credits that gives way to a train ride at night. Claustrophobic visuals relay the story of Esther and Anna, two sisters played by Bergman Staples, Ingrid Tulin, and Gunnar Lindblom. Esther's terminal illness forces the trio to hold up in a once glamorous hotel as the world outside appears to be on the brink of war, with tanks and soldiers moving through the streets. However, Bergman's screenplay foregoes political themes and instead chooses to delve into the psyche of his leads, the central Anna and the repressed older sister, Esther. Over the course of a few days, we slowly begin to grapple with the tension between Esther and Anna, though only opaquely. Despite being the final chapter in Bergman's unofficial faith trilogy, The Silence features no overt religious themes. The viewer must seek to interpret and understand the images and sounds, making this among the most challenging films of the 1960s. The frank depictions of sexuality and nudity caused the film to be heavily censored in a number of countries, but also spurred public curiosity that turned this modest movie into an arthouse hit. Released by the Criterion Collection on DVD in 2003 as part of the A Film Trilogy by Ingmar Bergman box set, as well as on Blu-ray as part of the comprehensive Ingmar Bergman's Cinema Collection, the silence is preserved in pristine condition for future generations to hear its message. Join Matt and me as we try to interpret the sights and sounds of silence. Well, Matt, as we begin our discussion today, I think, if I'm correct, this is your first time seeing this movie. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. So what are your initial impressions for this film? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I, I need to watch uh, certain Bergman films with a psychologist uh, sitting next to me because... Uh, man, I, uh, there's a lot to, to decode here, and I feel I feel like a lot of what we're seeing is in, in need of the interpretation of a clinical psychologist. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that you mention this film doesn't really have any overt religious themes, and I, I, it's hard to see how this fits, you know, with the previous two films. And I know Bergman initially said this was a trilogy, then he later kind of retracted that statement to say that they're not. Um, I, I mean, I, I can understand why these films are grouped together, but at the same time, there isn't a whole lot of unity to, to what we're seeing here. Um, and, and maybe that's just my, my lack of uh, in, interpretive you know, prowess or wh- whatever you want to say in, in, after my initial viewing here, but... Um, I, and you mentioned how this film was very popular and, and seemed to do well commercially. Uh, you wonder about the reasoning behind that, uh, whether or not the, the nudity was, was a big draw. I mean, that probably was a factor here. I'm not trying to belittle the film or cheapen the film by any means. But, um, you know, on its surface, you wouldn't think that this would be a film that would be burning up the box office. Um I, you know, it's an interesting picture. I, I, I think there's a lot to unpack. There's a lot to uh, to discuss. There's a lot to kind of interpret, and there's different ways you could really approach this film. Uh, it, it's a beautiful film to look at. I mean, Sven Nykvist, of course, just uh, his camera work is incredible. And and stylistically, uh, just the, the use of the camera, there's quite a few long takes, reframing, uh, of shots during the course of long takes, especially that opening is a, a very long extended shot on the train. Uh, so from a filmmaking craft standpoint, it, it's very impressive. Um, 
but as a whole, you know, the film really feels like a nightmare. It, it feels very dreamlike to me, and it feels very much uh, like a film that's really not meant to be taken at face value, right? So it's hard for me to look at this as a kind of a, a very literal story that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to believe in the setting and believe in the world in which this is taking place. You know, you mentioned it takes place in a fictional country, uh, on the verge of a fictional conflict. So it, it, it feels like everything, every element of the film is has some kind of meaning behind it and it kind of creates this artifice, right? This feeling of artificiality in which Bergman can explore, you know, the themes he wants to explore. So and we'll get into more, of course, as we keep talking. Uh, but those are my initial impressions. Technically, very impressive, uh, very much a, a dreamlike film, though just on first viewing, I, I felt it was not as strong as the two previous films. It's fi- it's funny. This is only my second time watching it. The first time I saw it was way back in college when it came out as part of the box set from Criterion in the DVD collection. Uh, and then I never went back to it for almost 20 years. So it's it's the only almost like watching it anew uh, for this uh, first, for the second time. It was almost like the first time watching it because I just had such a distant memory of it. Yeah. Uh, I do recall when I first saw it thinking it was the best of the three films, but now that I've watched it again, I think it probably is the weakest of the three. Hmm. And I think, you know, just on the whole concept, maybe we could just talk briefly about the idea of the film trilogy. This is why I actually ch- selected it. It's uh, because we already have previously discussed Through a Glass Darkly and Winter Light, I thought, you know what, let's get around to finishing this up and talking about the silence here. Uh, which also, by the way, now Bergman is the first director to be featured in three of our episodes uh, for yeah. this. So no other director has gotten three. So he's he's in the lead right now. Um, <laughs> see if anybody wants to come and challenge him and take him off his throne. Um, but anyways, uh, when I saw it, I think... I was blown away probably by the audacity of the film and just thinking, my gosh, in 1963, this movie was released. Yeah. And uh, I think that was probably a big part of what struck me in it. I think I also was very much drawn into the psychology that was on display. Uh, I think Bergman takes it seriously and he definitely is making a pivot. This is a very much a turning point in his career that will continue to be elaborated through the rest of the 60s and into the 70s, uh, where he does have a much more psychological focus, as well as a heavier emphasis on women as the central figures of his films. So it's it's kind of a, a just a watershed in that regard, in terms of a, clearly announcing a new direction. It, But I would never think of this as connected to Through a Glass Darkly or to Winter Light, and quite frankly... If he had never made a comment about the three of them as having a link to one another, one suspects nobody would ever talk about these as a trilogy. Uh, I think that there's a more obvious through line from Through a Glass Darkly to Winter Light, but this seems to be in an entirely different space. Uh, so I know that it is given a sort of con- a pairing with those other two, uh, but I don't know that it really belongs with the other two, and I think sometimes that actually makes trying to interpret this or understand this even more difficult because there's always a part of it trying to say, well, how does this connect to these other two films when I quite frankly don't see the connection? But then again, maybe there's a a point behind that. You know, there's a part of it that's willing to say maybe the fact that I can't make sense of something is part of the film's purpose as well. Uh, So I find it a, a very rich film, but a very challenging film. I'd say it's by far one of the most difficult films to interpret from Bergman's career. And I think it's it's certainly not an easy film to watch. You talked about it as almost like a nightmare. And there are images, there are expressions and acting tidbits here and there that really almost look like they come out of a horror film. If you just took a still of it, it might look like it's something out of a horror film as opposed to something out of an Ingmar Bergman film, right? And so I think it is a very harrowing film in many ways. But... All of this being said, I also think it's it's a very fascinating film, uh, not just for the technical merits of it, but I think thematically there's there's a lot to just kind of let it absorb and kind of draw you into it and then focus it uh, or focus you as an audience member into considering themes and just uh, concepts that you might not otherwise 
ever bring in uh, to your evening or whatever it might be, then you watch it, right? So I really did think this was still a very strong film, even though I, now that I watched it a second time, I, I don't think quite as highly of it as I had in, in my initial viewing of it. Yeah, I think... Uh, <laughs> I guess where I struggle with it is, again, just kind of the artifice of it, the fact that uh, it has a very dreamlike quality to it, yet at the same time, I get the feeling that Bergman wants us to look at this film kind of in a literal sense to a degree. I mean, I, I do think there's, you know, metaphor at play here. There's definitely, uh, you know, a psychological examination at play here, but there is as you said, kind of a difficulty in interpretation that, that goes on. Um, the film kind of catches you off guard. You just don't quite know how to approach it. Right. And you know, the two main characters, uh, characters, so Esther and Anna, they seem to me to be kind of two dimensions of the same person. I know that that theory has been floated out there about this film, I think uh, you know Woody Allen even specifically uh, mentioned that, and to me that seems very evident here that that this almost seems like a, a representation of two sides of one person, specifically Johann's mother, right? And it's interesting that Johann is kind of very much the through line in this film, right? I mean he's the one element that's consistently involved with pretty much every aspect of the story and every aspect of uh, the events and the characters. And in some ways he's the surrogate for the audience. You know, we're kind of following him along through this abandoned hotel and, and he's exploring uh, the different rooms and the different people in the, in this area. And also um, trying to kind of define his own relationship with, with Anna and um, and Esther and uh, Anna and Esther being sisters, of course. Anna being his um, his mother. And there are times where you know they're kind of competing for his affections, and and he's trying to decide you know which uh, individual is more worthy of of his attention. And you know Esther represents very much an intellectual, right? She's a translator. She's uh, she's working on presumably translating some kind of text, but she's very ill and seemingly from some kind of a lung condition. And uh, Anna is very much the emotional one, right? Uh, more sensual, more sexually oriented. So this is it's kind of two sides of one person, right? So it's it's the more emotional uh, side versus the intellectual side, and. It's interesting because Johan initially very much is an affinity for his own true, you know, real mother, right? But by the end of the film, he seems to have a real sense of compassion and empathy for Esther and her situation. So it's kind of this uh, maturing that we're seeing through his eyes where he's pivoting toward a more emotional connection toward one that's more intellectual as he gets older. So that's one interpretation I, I kind of felt was clear thematically. Um, but again, this, you know, you know, it kind of reminded me of The Shining, this movie. <laughs> I don't know if there's any inspiration uh, from this, but just, you know, a small child wandering through a more abandoned or semi-abandoned hotel and, and all these strange characters in the different rooms. And you have like those uh, Spanish dwarfs or, you know, a circus act or, uh, and then the 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 butler who um, uh, is there in and out of the film at various points. So I, I, I don't know if Stephen King or Kubrick had any kind of uh, inspiration from this film, but uh, it definitely reminded me of The Shining at times. I feel like The Shining comes up kind of occasionally in just so, certain movies remind us of it. It definitely... Uh, did not remind me of it here, but I just feel like that is a movie that we keep bringing up at different times. We watch movies that think, "Gosh, this seems like the silent or the Shining had something to do with this." You know, on a few different occasions here, because yeah. uh, it does that film does have a kind of resonance that seems to connect in with other movies that came before it. So it could well be that there was some influence there. Um, I do, you know, 
I don't think I'm of the opinion that we should interpret anything here as being highly symbolic. The film doesn't strike me as having a lot of symbolism in it, and Bergman wasn't a director that did a lot of symbolism. He he had a lot of rich thought and themes in his films, but he wasn't a highly symbolic filmmaker or artist. And so I, I, I never really interpreted this as anything other than a literal story. Hmm. Uh, that's not to say that there isn't uh, depths to it that you know you really have to struggle with and grapple with, uh, that everything's maybe right there on the surface. I think there's a lot of subtext here. But I never really kind of have been convinced of that theme, that Anna and Esther are two facets, two facets of the same person. Uh, I understand that that is an appealing interpretation, especially in light of his later work like Persona. But I think there might be a, a, an issue where people are lead, reading later works into this work here. I don't know that he had developed that kind of thinking yet in terms of playing around with that question of identity the way he might in something like Persona. But I do think that he's definitely trying to grapple with the question of the feminine here in a way that he may not have in previous works. And that's kind of what Esther and Anna show is these different dimensions of what it is to be feminine. And you're right, the the character Johan is very much our our vessel, our, our access point into this. A lot of the camera work is very subjective. I'm thinking in particular the scene where he goes out into the hallway and is walking up to the worker on the ladder and how the, the camera takes these very subjective shots and angles of, of the man working. Uh, so, you know, you just have this sense that Johan is meant to be very much the, the interpreter of events of sorts here and yet himself not really understanding what is going on. He doesn't really understand his mother's sexuality and he's kind of overwhelmed by it. You know, he has the scene where he notices her go off with the man. And it's clearly disturbing to him, and he doesn't understand it, and he feels a certain sense of isolation. And then you also have the scene where he's uh, talking to Esther uh, and doesn't really seem to be able to connect with her either, right? Uh, she, as she's t- discussing to him about what will happen when they eventually get to the grandparents' house uh, and he'll be uh, you know, with his aunt and uncle and be able to have this new life there and kind of nicer things, and he doesn't really kind of connect with things she's saying to him that would be fun there, right? Because he's scared of horses and things like that. So it's it's a fascinating thing to see in that regard, but I don't see these two characters meant to be different dimensions of the same person, but rather different dimensions of what it is to be feminine. I think Bergman's really trying to wrestle with the nature of the feminine uh, mystique, I guess, you know, if I can pull a phrase out of our popular cultural heritage. Uh, so uh, that's, I guess, kind of the way I look at this film, as seeing it looking at that. What I find really fascinating in that is that uh, it, it shows the, the challenges, I think, that these different aspects of the feminine have, right? Uh, the, the challenge of Anna as she is this more embracing of her, of her carnal nature, right? Uh, is that she winds up coming across as being silly. Uh, she's not as taken as seriously. She doesn't seem to have accomplished much. Uh, so she has this sense of being just viewed through that only that prism, right? So she's almost thought of as incomplete because of that. And then Esther is frustrated. She's dying. She has all these things that aren't going her way either, even though she's this some kind of, you know, no, it seems to be some kind of notorious intellectual uh, is nonetheless unfulfilled as well and kind of misunderstood and not appreciated. And so I think the, the sense that Bergman's getting at is that these two dimensions of the feminine somehow have to be connected into one another. You can't isolate the one from the other. At least that's one lens by which to look at this film. That's kind of the way I've seen it. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, he could be saying that going one extreme or the other is not healthy, right? So they're they're both kind of unbalanced individuals in very different ways, right? And mm-hmm. um, I mean, you could even apply that to humanity in general, uh, and not necessarily just you know uh, the feminine. Uh, just this idea of of uh, extremism in, in any one direction, you know the maybe the right the right way to exist or the right way to approach 
um, life is, is, uh, again, more in the balance, right. Or the, the balance between, uh, ripe and ruin, I guess is one, one way to look at it. But, um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting that you kind of view this more as, as a straightforward kind of literal presentation because I, it just to me, it just seems so surreal in, in so many ways that, uh, it, it certainly seems more symbolic or more metaphorical. And, and I understand, uh, you know, Bergman as a director, that's typically not his approach. Uh, he's more attuned to, uh, investigating ideas, uh, I think more directly or, or through, uh, more literal storytelling. But, um, I, of course he's quite fond of, of, I think the idea of using a, a child's viewpoint, uh, to, you know, not only be the surrogate for the audience, but to help maybe kind of simplify, um, the, the viewpoint of the film. Uh, so it makes some of these ideas maybe easier to understand for the audience, but it's, yeah, it's a challenging film. I mean, it's just it's it's hard to know which way to go with it and and what angle to from which to kind of attack it. Um, well, since you you have the kind of the idea that it's like a um, maybe more symbolic. What what strikes you as being that surreal side to it or that symbolic side to it? Just the like, whole what setting. Would be the things you you latch onto. Yeah, just the whole setting, right? And and the the very claustrophobic nature of the film. Uh, the fact that we're in this fictional country with this language that no one seems to understand. Uh, there's a, an impending war, uh, but we just don't know the details of that. Uh, the characters don't seem interested in what's going on. Um, just the idea that they would stop in a country or in a city that's on the verge of war just to stay there seems like a very odd decision, too. And it just seems very dreamlike to me. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense that characters would make a decision like that, especially if they're traveling with a, a small child. Um, so the the whole setting uh, it, it just really seems to border on the surreal to me, and and the different people that are within this hotel, and and even when they look out onto the street, uh, you know, there's uh, horses and carriages, and and almost elements that are taken out of time and, and placed in this supposed modern setting. We do see that one brief moment of that tank, uh, that, you know, kind of infuses some technology or some more modern technology into what we're seeing. But, um, it just it has a very surreal quality to it. Um, even the camera work, I mean, evokes that to me. You know, just the the opening scene on the train is a very long, extended shot. There's a lot of reframing and and panning, and it, you know, it's beautifully executed. You know, the whole film is just beautifully shot and presented. I think, um, but it, it there's very little editing, and and the use of the close up is, is something we've seen from Bergman, and you know, we'll see again, of course. Uh, especially in persona. Uh, but that's very evident here too. You know, the, the actor's faces are, uh, really the, the primary focus on a lot of these scenes because, I mean, let's face it, the, the film has very few locations, right? I mean, we're on a train, we're in a, a hotel room where we have that brief, uh, scene in the cafe and in the movie theater, but on the whole, it's, it's in the, the hotel room. And, mm-hmm this this very kind of claustrophobic quality to it again kind of uh evokes a, a dreamlike state to me so yeah it's yeah it would be interesting to know uh what bergman's intent was in that regard uh because there just seems to be a very concerted effort here to obscure uh the setting you know obscure the details that we would need to kind of cling on to um, for this to be taken more literally, you know, so the fact that it's taking place in a, a war-torn area, I think it was inspired by by Bergman seeing a lot of European cities right after World War II. You know, so why not just set it during World War II? You know, why are, why are we setting it in this sort of fictional uh, world? Uh, again, it just seems like a very intentional decision uh, to create this surreal environment. <laughs> 
But I do wonder to what extent is that a part of us watching it as Americans and also as you know men that were born in the 1980s? Would a would a European not only with the experiences of World War II, but just even with the experiences of the Cold War and how there were troops moving around throughout Europe and the sense that a war could happen, you know, I'm sure at different points in time, especially, I mean, we don't always think about just the, the behind the Iron Curtain, which I think a Swedish filmmaker would have a much more acute idea of what was happening in Eastern Europe than we do. And since this film seems to be set in Central Europe, uh, you, know, you would have that perhaps be kind of more sort of a normal thing and people just learned how to live with that tension and that that in, intense sort of reality around them and deal with it. And it, it. It sort of, I think, helps feed into the emotional aspect of the film and elevates the, the gravity of this rather simple, straightforward story, which is very, very bare. It's two sisters that have, have a strained relationship with one another. Uh, and different personalities that clash, right? And uh, that's all there is to it. So it, it does kind of, I think, it, the setting in that sense helps us to get into the minds of these characters uh, in a way that it wouldn't otherwise. So I guess, you could you say that's symbolic? Maybe that's, I guess, in a certain sense, symbolic. Um, it doesn't strike me as quite being surreal, uh, but then again, there might be different degrees of surrealism as well. Uh, so that's just, I wonder though, is that part of the reason why these things strike us as so jarring where they might not to somebody like Bergman? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it could certainly be an intentional decision by Bergman to um, not distract the audience uh, in a way to make them think about, okay, if this is World War II, then they have a preconceived notion of, of that environment, right? But instead, it's just more, mm-hmm. okay, there's there's war present, there's the threat of conflict, and that's all that really matters. So it, it could be a, a decision to try to just simplify that that sort of environment. But at the same time, it does create you know this real sense of mystery that might not be, end up being more distracting <laughs> than if he just did set it in a more familiar uh, era or a more familiar country. Um, but... Yeah, it's. I guess it's hard to really know what the true intent was there. Well, that gets at, I think, part of what does work about the film and what does intrigue me about this film uh, is the difficulty in interpreting it, right? And I think that's, that's a large part of what Bergman's trying to do. The initial title for this was, instead of The Silence, it was God's Silence. And then they, I don't know exactly what the reasoning was why they made that translation. Uh, but I think... It does kind of get at that sense of how do you interpret and understand the world around you and the people around you? Uh, I think that's a big part of this film and realizing that each of us in our life will have sort of a, the challenge to, through events, through locations, through people of trying to make sense of them, right? And this film seems to be trying to say, how do we make sense of this, right? How do we understand this? And the characters in many ways, in many ways are trying to make sense of each other. I think Anna's trying to make sense of Esther and vice versa, and Johan's trying to make sense of both of them, and they're all trying to make sense of this language they don't understand. And I do think that's a big part of it. And then, of course, in an implicit way, because I, like I said, there's nothing explicit here, but in an implicit way, the film does seem then to say, how do we make sense of God who seems to be so silent in the world? Uh, could be, I think, a part of this uh, this film as well. Uh, so I'm just curious to know what your thought is just about this concept of silence and and the idea of this film maybe being ultimately about God's silence or apparent silence. Yeah, I, I think thematically and conceptually, I actually think that's kind of a reach for this film. I, I, I was kind of trying to parse through that, you know, before our conversation. You know, why why is this seen as... Uh, you know, pertaining to God's silence and, and the film, I mean, uh, like you had said earlier, it just doesn't really have religious themes, at least not overtly. So just the lack of the themes uh, or the lack of religious themes is that equal God being silent, right? I, uh, but the characters don't even seem to have a desire to explore the, the religious or the spiritual. Um, and, and maybe it's a, more the idea that they don't know what they're lacking, right? They don't realize that they're lacking that kind of spiritual 
element to their lives or the they're lacking the desire to even know God. Maybe that's what, what the film is trying to say. But clearly, you know, compared to the previous two films uh, in this trilogy, uh, there, there just is no overt discussion of God or even, even a reference to God. I, you know, one, one interpretation you could say is, okay, this is a depiction of a world without God, right? I mean, that's another way to look at it, I guess. This is just a world that's left. I think, that's a, I think that's a fair way to look at it, too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, it's just a film that's left to its own devices. It's left uh, to be defined by um, human, you know, foibles and, and misery and, and uh, uh, maybe you could even say uh, the sinful aspects of humanity. Uh, you could look at it that way, right? Whether it be uh, from a more, you know, lustful kind of sins of the flesh sort of uh, viewpoint, versus even you know sins of the intellect and and trying to uh, depend solely on human intellect to solve one's problems. I mean, that could be one one way to look at it too. Um, but it's it's very interesting that this film is called that, you know, because on its surface it doesn't seem to be exploring that uh, explicitly or overtly. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think the film is definitely well. I'll I'll try to answer that question. And look at it this way: there is a reference to God. In it, there's two references to God in it. The first is in Esther, who prays to God in that initial scene where she's having that intense pain, and the second is when Anna is telling her the story about having hooked up with a man and that they snuck into the church into a dark corner and had sex in the church, right? And so I think it's the sense that these characters are so far removed from a concept of God or an idea of God that there's nothing but like a, a, a gulf in that sense of their life, right? Whereas in the first two films, there is a very apparent and acute awareness of God and trying to figure out why aren't things working, right? This one seems to be, we just assume there is no God or that the, our God, our concept of God is so far removed from us that this world just doesn't seem to relate to God at all. I don't know if that helps answer the question or not. No, I, I, I think it does. I mean, I, I think that's probably the way you have to look at it, and it's kind of the only way the uh, the title works. I think within the context of this film, but um, I, you know, I, I do have to say. I, a lot of Bergman films that I've seen, I, I, I do find them quite inspirational, you know, insofar as, again, here's a film with very limited settings, limited actors, very talented actors, of course. But the fact that you can, you know, tell a story like this that has, you know, challenge to it, uh, thematic depth to it, and... Um, well, at least in the 1960s, uh, seemed to get uh, well, uh, you know, do well commercially and, and get some notoriety. Uh, it, it's just inspiration, you know, it, it, from a, a filmmaker standpoint to look at something like this and and uh, really appreciate its ambition, uh, but also its artistry. But um, that's what I, I guess I tend to take away from Bergman's films more than anything, and I think I may have even said that before uh, during one of our previous podcasts uh, about, I can't remember if it was for Winter Light or Through Glass Darkly, but uh, definitely inspirational, just, just how he, he can craft so much from seemingly so little. I agree with that. I think one of the things people don't always appreciate with Bergman is his quality as a filmmaker. And I, that sounds ironic because he's one of the most exalted filmmakers of all time. But I think in terms of craft, people talk a lot about the screenplays. They talk a lot about the themes, and understandably so. They're, they're kind of those classic themes and these very heady kinds of concepts that – 
are going to make you think and make you ponder things and you know f- feed into good conversation over coffee, right? But just the craft that's at work in his films is astonishing, and he does change with each film a little bit. You know, he's got his definitely own notorious style, but this film, for example, is one where the camera moves a lot more. Prior to this, he didn't really move the camera much, except for occasionally a, a push in on a, a character's face or a, a brief whip of a, the you know, whip pan or something like that. He, they, here's a lot more movement here, a lot more reframing that's taking place within a single shot than you'd find in previous work. And I think that highlights a lot of the, the sense of trying to explore these characters and the camera becoming sort of that probing, inspecting figure in the telling of the story. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned, Matt, the just the close-ups. And I think the close-ups here are extremely effective. Sometimes they can be in a movie... Well, sometimes they're just there because you're lazy and you just light the camera's, uh, the actor's face, you know. But I think here there's there's an intentionality in them. And, and it really kind of invites you to really study and understand who these people are and what they are saying, what they are not saying, right? All those different things that are taking place within the performances are captured wonderfully in these close-ups. Uh, so I guess I'd be curious to hear your just your thoughts about the craft. Uh, I know we've talked a little about it a little bit, but just in terms of the use of close-ups, how, how do you find them effective in this film? Yeah, I mean, the close-ups are, are really there just to pick up on the, the subtlety of the performances too, right? But But also to just remove the character from the environment in such a way that uh, we kind of forget where they are and we're really focused on their emotion at any given moment. And some of those shots are, are, are very, you know, impressive. Just, uh, you know, we, we've talked before about the difference between, you know, stage acting and screen acting. Of course, screen uh, cinema, acting for the cinema is much more about uh, nuances, right? And much more about uh, very small expressions at times and, and this film captures that beautifully i mean just uh small facial expressions uh the eyes um so esther in particular has has quite a bit of screen time where she's just by herself and smoking and drinking and kind of navigating about the uh the the hotel room and and you know she has those those coughing fits at times but just the level of emotion and that comes across her face at various moments. It's very powerful and, and, and very, um, very effective too. So yeah, I mean, Bergman, I, I think is right to, um, to use that device, uh, pretty frequently here because ultimately the, the setting is just that. I mean, I, I think, uh, he doesn't want us to, to get lost in the environment or to get overwhelmed by the environment. And, and maybe that's why he chooses to set this in an anonymous country and, you know, during a conflict that has no really detail attached to it. Um, he's uh, trying to strip away the environment uh, by by keeping it ambiguous so we can focus on on those performances and on those on those faces just more acutely. It's a film that has actually very little dialogue. You know, a movie like this would often be loaded up with dialogue. And, you know, if you think of it, that's maybe another way way in which it diverges from the previous two parts of the trilogy in that this one isn't very dialogue heavy. Those have a lot of talking in them. And this one has many scenes that play out for almost no dialogue whatsoever. The dialogue that there is almost incidental to what's being said or what's happening, right? And so it's, it's just a... Visual storytelling very clearly is part of Bergman's intent here, right? And he uses the close-ups as part of telling the story and communicating the themes and letting the uh, the cast do their work, right? And I think it's really impressive acting here. We haven't really talked about the performances very much, but uh, all three, uh, so Esther by Ingrid Utulin, Anna by Gunnar Lindblom, and Johan by Jorgen Lindström are all, I think, very impressive in their performances here. Uh, we, I think, obviously, the the two leads of the 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 women are the more notable ones. But Johan, even Jorgen Lundstrom's performance, I think he captures a boy very well. That prepubescent, just on the verge of entering into kind of an awareness of larger things, uh, he captures that performance very nicely. And I think that he hap- he captures the boredom. He captures the 
lack of understanding. Uh, you know, just without it coming across, kids' performances can be so difficult uh, to get right. And this one, I think they get a really good performance out of him that really helps bring the film together that it would be a lot less successful without him and the work he does in it. Yeah, all three of them are great. I mean, they're all very convincing, right, in their own roles. And and um, I, I, ultimately, a film like this really lives or dies by its performances, right, because because of the simplicity of it uh, in, in terms of its construction and even the story itself. So uh, they, they all deliver... Uh, very strong performances. So, uh, yeah, no no complaints there by any means. What I would also say for our, our leads, for Inger Tulin and Gunnel Blindblom, uh, they both had fairly audacious performances to give. Uh, yeah, I think any in any era, this would be you know just anything that requires a performer to engage in some frank sexuality is always going to be a challenge, right? And you know, go back now 60 years almost, and it would be even more of a challenge for them, I think. Because uh, there just was such little precedent for it in other movies, yeah. um, and maybe that's just worth talking about, just Matt, uh, because that was one of the things that was part big part of it. I actually, I, I was watching the trailer for the U.S. release of it. It was really funny because the movie clearly, uh, the trailer's clearly giving like a moral tone to the sex in the film, but also is clearly trying to like highlight it in order to get people to come and see it, like. Look at this salacious movie, yeah. Uh, which yeah. I can only imagine. I can only imagine the number of tickets that were sold to young men to see this movie that wound up being extremely disappointed by, by it. <laughs> uh, because I'm sure you'd have been like, "Whoa!" I thought I was going into a, a porno or something like that with the way some of the the talk of of it was, and it's definitely not that. No. Um, but what are your thoughts about it? Because it is pretty bold and pretty frank uh, in terms of how it handles those themes. Yeah, it's definitely pretty direct, right? In a couple couple portions. I mean, um, the the movie theater portion uh, certainly is probably the most graphic part, but it's never it never feels gratuitous to me. I guess if anything, it's fairly restrained at times. And of course, you have to remember it's nineteen sixty three. Um, I, I mean, I, the fact that it had, was such a commercial success, I mean, we probably have to admit to the reality that, you know, a lot of that was probably people uh, looking to uh, catch a glimpse of something, right? And uh, so they bought a ticket. But um, insofar as how it works in the film, I mean, I, I, I think it's very intentional uh, and, uh, you know, appropriate thematically. Uh, the character of Anna, of course, is is the more you know sensual, more carnal, more kind of earthly oriented character in that regard. And it, it's interesting that you know she kind of uh, exudes this sort of sensuality, but when when the uh, the time comes and and she witnesses that other couple in the, in the movie theater, she's almost repulsed, uh, by that or, or made very uncomfortable by it. So it, it kind of suggests to a point that, that maybe a lot of that is, uh, an artifice for her, you know, or it's, it's how she, uh, you know, chooses to, um, conduct herself or at least portray herself, uh, in the world. But, isn't maybe necessarily willing to, to follow through with, with that. Uh, but later on she does meet up with that waiter and they kind of have that tryst. Uh, so it seems like she is kind of as a character, even struggling with her own, uh, her own sexuality and how that defines her as a person. Uh, and I think Bergman is, is making that point clear with those different situations. Well, I think that's part of why this film works better than it, Otherwise, in the hands of a different director, it would have been so... It could have been exploitative or it would have been so obvious what they were doing with it. The yeah. repressed sister, the liberated sister, or the the virtuous sister, or the um, vicious, you know, as in uh, full of lust, vice, right, uh, sister, right? I mean, it's... So it's, it's, it's not that. I mean, you see, as you said, Anna has this clear kind of repulsion at the display that she sees of the other couple in the movie theater. Uh, 
uh, and then uh, yet has this clear like it, it's unclear where the father is in the picture here with Johan so it, there's nothing indicating she's married uh, and if she is then she obviously has an affair uh, with this other man so you know she obviously has this not exactly perfectly clear simplistic view of sex herself and Ingrid, uh, excuse me, Esther, played by Ingrid uh, Tulin, uh, is uh, herself also clearly repulsed by sex and talks about it, but then you see her masturbate, right? So, I mean, you, you don't have this kind of clear, you know, one's perfectly this, one's perfectly that, and let me get this type, let me get that type, yeah. and then just play out these kind of obvious, uh, almost uh, unrealistic portrayals of, of people. Uh, it's a lot more nuanced and complicated than that. And I think that's what makes this film so much more intriguing because it does make you go, gosh, how am I trying to make sense of this? Which I think is ultimately what the film really t winds up trying to be about. How do you make sense and interpret and understand the people and the world around you? I think that's what the film's trying to say. Well, the film even suggests a potential inc you know, incestuous relationship between the sisters. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's an accurate interpretation or not, but uh, Esther certainly seems to suggest that in that one dialogue scene. Um, difficult to, to reconcile that, I guess, with the rest of the film. Right, and it's, you know, it's interesting because I'm not sure if that's an accurate interpretation, if that was ever meant, if it was just yeah. added into it. Um, it's because it, I... I, I, I have a hard time in seeing that interpretation really holding together, but I know that a lot of people talk about it that way, and it's not like it's not been kind of hinted at or, or been thrown around in other works by Bergman, right? The idea of, uh, of siblings having some sort of incestuous uh, connection with each other. Uh, so it's possible that it's supposed to be understood that way. I, I have not read it that way myself, though. Well, Matt, uh, I guess we could turn our attention here to the Criterion release of it. I did get this back in the day on DVD uh, as part of that box set on the trilogy. And then, of course, when I got the massive box set for Bergman, uh, I got the Blu-ray. Uh, so I've, I've seen it in both editions here. It's a new transfer from 2015 that they used for the, the current Blu-ray edition of it. And it looks gorgeous. And it also um, uh, has a couple of different features on it. All of them are carryovers from the original DVD release. Uh, there's the uh, little video discussion with Peter Cowley. Uh, there's a U.S. trailer and then some photo galleries uh, as well of different posters. Uh, what are your thoughts on Criterion's release of it? Yeah, it looks great. I, I've got the, the giant Bergman box set, so... Um... The, the transfer looks outstanding. I mean, it's it's really a beautiful film to look at. Um, very, very clean print. Uh, so, yeah, really impressive uh, visually. So the um, I think Criterion also re-released the trilogy just on standalone Blu-ray as well, didn't they? They did, yes. Yeah. So um, it's, I, yeah, I, I still... I don't know I still struggle to to include this film with the first two films, but uh, you know at least in the setting of of that uh, big Bergman box set, it feels more feels more appropriate. And so on that point, Matt, does this belong? I think I think we're both agreed it probably doesn't really, or at least we have a hard time seeing it as part of a trilogy. Yeah. But that being said, it is recognized as a trilogy. Does this film belong in the Criterion Collection? However. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think it deserves to be there. I I still would say it's the weakest of the three films in that trilogy, and just the fact that this is considered a trilogy uh, makes me think it should be included in the collection. Um, you know, if it was just a standalone film on its own, I may struggle to say yes. Even though I, I do think it's a good film, you know, I, I don't want people to think I don't like it, but it's it's challenging and maybe not the greatest kind of challenging at times uh it, it is opaque to the level of of being you know almost too difficult to penetrate uh from a standpoint of of interpretation uh but you know I, some people really like films like that and i do at times too 
but yeah, within the context of Bergman's career and the fact that it's part of this trilogy, uh, I think it deserves to be included. Well, certainly if Criterion's going to do a massive box set of Bergman's whole filmography, you put it in there. And as you're, even if I don't think of this perfectly as a trilogy and Bergman himself later came to not consider it a trilogy, the fact that it's been known and understood as a trilogy of films uh, and this being the third part of it, I think that also would be reasons to put it in there. Again, on its own, it'd be tough for me to say yes. It's kind of an important film as far as understanding Ingmar Bergman's career because there is a clear pivot that happens here that will make sense with his later works. But on its own, I would say probably I wouldn't think of it as being in the Criterion Collection. But as part of this larger context, the answer is yes. So I guess we're both in the same boat on that. Uh, on its own, maybe not. But as part of a larger consideration of Bergman, definitely yes. Thank you all for joining us for our conversation here this evening. We look forward to having everybody tune in next month as we discuss John Cassavetti's The Killing of a Chinese Bookie, which will be released in April. Thank you, and keep collecting.